If you are caring for someone else, whether paid or unpaid, and no matter how many hours you do it, did you realize that you may be missing out on thousands of pounds of discounts for things that you may use every day? The Able to Care podcast is proud to be sponsored by the UK's number one carers card. Started by two best friends who recognize that carers deserve better and are 100% committed to helping to change the lives of all carers and bringing them together as a strong community. Carers Card UK provides support, recognition and rewards. It offers reassurance by providing an ID card that helps access emergency information when needed, while also unlocking discounts, a well-being hub, a carer's circle tool and a community through their app. All of this for less than the price of a box of chocolates a year. There are discounts on gym membership, days out, electrical goods, clothing and even glasses. Let others know you care while taking a little care of yourself with an ID card you can be proud of. Visit carerscarduk.co.uk forward slash promo code forward slash able to care today to order yours. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Able to Care podcast. I am your host, Andy Baker, and I am so privileged to welcome a very special guest today onto my podcast. Today I am joined by actress Gemma Oten, whose career spans both stage and screen, including, and I've got quite a list here as far as BBC Doctors, Casualty, Holby City, Coronation Street, but her most recognisable role of Rachel Breckel in Emmerdale. I hope I pronounced that right because I have yeah, to, I've yeah. never watched it. Um, and in 2024, Gemma also began hosting her own radio show on BBC Radio Humber- uh, Humberside. Uh, Gemma counts Sir Patrick Stewart and Sir Tom uh, Courtenay as both mentors and friends. And it was actually Patrick Stewart who suggested she use her public profile to raise awareness for mental health, eating disorders, and bullying issues. In July 2019, Gemma did a first ever TEDx talk, uh, The Girl in the Mirror, The Woman on the Screen, The Reality of Eating Disorders. And Gemma is a CEO of a family's eating disorder charity, SEED, Eating Disorder Support Service Services. Uh, she regularly speaks to audiences around the UK about eating disorders, awareness, resilience, and facing adversity. She's also an ambassador for the Anti-Bullying Pro and works tirelessly as an ambassador for Prostate Cancer UK. <sighs> So no, that's <laughs> absolutely that took some getting through that did Gemma so thank you so much for joining me uh, and giving me your time today not at um, all not at all I think um, the one thing you missed off is that I'm dog mum to Ruby Ruby Tuesday of course that's the most important absolutely well that was at the top but I was waiting to kind of do that the big <laughs> the big reveal later on of <laughs> Um, so thank you for coming on uh, the Able to Care podcast. Obviously, our, we were connected through a mutual friend um, on LinkedIn, a lady called Hayley, who's actually been on my my podcast as well and, uh, and an absolutely fantastic human being. Uh, and she connected and um, she said that you were somebody definitely worth talking to. And, and obviously, I, I looked into what you're doing and the, the work that you're doing and thought, you know what, it's, it's a, an issue and a subject that many people in the care sector and many people... Uh, whether it be parents or caregivers are encountering this. So whether it be foster carers, children's homes workers or adult mental health, et cetera. So, um, yeah. Do you mind starting off by just telling us a little bit about your stories that got you to doing the, uh, becoming the CEO of a, of a charity and why your family's got this, this charity maybe? Gosh. Um, so Seed was co-founded 24 years ago. I mean, I can't believe that. Um, and it was co-founded by my mum and dad whilst I was in the grips of an eating disorder. I'd gone from being a really happy, carefree young girl. You know, I had um, my brother, two sisters, mum and dad. Like, there was no family issues apart from me and our Chris fighting over who wants to watch cricket and who wants to watch Home and Away Neighbours. Uh, <laughs> the usual, God, that's showing my age, isn't it? Um, my age as well, Gemma, don't you worry yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah, that's... <laughs> That era of, of five o'clock home and away and five thirty neighbours, all of that. Um, but yeah, you know, like they were they were quite a bit older than me, but there was never any issues at home. I felt very loved, very cared for. Um, I couldn't have asked for more, you know, in, in terms of 
our financial stability at the time. Like, so basically painting the picture of everything was idyllic. And I remember I was quite a, a tomboy. And I was always larking out, larking is um, playing out in whole speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> larking out, larking out with the lads. Um, you know, the, the girls were running around the playgrounds doing hopscotch and I was like playing football in the shorts and me. <laughs> bright red trainers um with my dumb and dumber bowler hat haircut um but I was happy and you know mum and dad were always very very open about embracing who I wanted to be and how I wanted to to, to look and what I wanted to wear and at, at that point I, I, I really couldn't give a knack like I was just happy um and then puberty started to kick in um and sort of my body changing and, and my my outlook changing and I remember sort of saying to mum mum do, do you think do you think I could get my hair cut into a more girly hairstyle do, do you think maybe I could wear like a nice dress like the other girls wear and bless her went went to the hairdressers got it put into a little bob and that grew out and then she made me a dress um because she's an amazing seamstress so she made me a dress um and it just felt like that joy was very quickly taken away from me and that identity, I wasn't allowed it because the green-eyed monster came along and the dynamics in the playground changed very, very quickly. Um, The girls became very nasty and not all of them, but but the the ones that, you know what it's like being in in those um, scenarios, the ones that count. I mean, there's a film called Mean Girls for that reason, isn't there? Um, so I started to get bullied and um, it, it was never physical. Um, it was always words and it was always painful because I could never articulate with my words why I was feeling the way I was feeling. And I remember sort of thinking, what had I done that was so wrong to warrant this? And then equally at the same time, you know, the dynamics were changing in the playground with with the lads, like, you know, kiss chase became a game. I don't know anybody listening who's, who's not our age. <laughs> like kiss chase is like you, you run around the playground and, and the, the boy comes and taps you on the shoulder and then you get a kiss on the cheek. It's it's so daft, but like, you know, it was changing and our curiosities were changing. And, you know, but for me, I found it very alien because I'd never been seen as like that before. And um, whilst my physical appearance had changed I was also excelling at, at sport I had a reading age of um 16 at the age of like eight you know I had my drama and I was getting the lead in all of the plays and just I just felt like everything went wrong when I started doing well and started to blossom and I remember overnight it felt like everything changed in my head and I remember being in the bathroom in Hull and like <laughs> It was um, one of those chaotic houses where there's only one bathroom between three teenagers, um, the young one, me, and my mum and dad. So there's our Chris wanting to have, have a shave, there's my dad wanting to have a wee, and there's me in the bath, and there's my sister trying to get the, the airbrush from the, the mirror and all that. So my, my point being is that it's a very like, liberal home. I remember uh, I was in the bath, and um, you know, dad was there, like, brushing his teeth and I was in the bath and the mum was bobbing in and out. Anyway, I remember standing up in the bath and looking at dad and going, dad, am I fat? And I honestly don't know where that thought came from because I'd never, ever, ever been conscious about my weight. None of the bullying that happened was about my weight and physical appearance. Um, Mm. And that was it. Life life changed forever. Um, Mum and Dad took me to the doctor very early on because we were so close um, that I remember them sitting me down and saying, Gemma, we can see that you're not happy and you're losing weight and, you know, we're concerned and we think you might have something called anorexia. And I'd never really understood what anorexia was, but I felt relieved that Mum and Dad were able to to put a name to it and that it wasn't me going crazy. Yeah. Um, and we went to the doctor and the doctor weighed me and said, I wasn't low enough in weight to have a problem. And uh, it was probably just a phase and to keep an eye on me. 
And then within a year, I was admitted to a children's psychiatric unit, put on bed rest and given 24 hours to live. Um, oh, wow. And that, that, that became my life for 13 years in and out of hospitals, units. Um, and that was the reason SEED was set up, because there was nothing. There was yeah. nothing, not just for me, Andrew, like there was nothing for my mum and dad and my family. Like they got, they got torn apart by a broken system, like fingers being pointed um, to my, my mum and dad, like trying to get it out of me that I'd been abused, um, which I categorically hadn't. Mm. Um, trying to point fingers at my siblings. Like it was just, it, it was just, hell really yeah. and um and I felt at the time it was all my fault so like the system and the care system that I was meant to be getting help from actually probably made me a lot worse and um mum and dad decided to make a change and create a safe space for people to to talk about eating disorders for the parents and loved ones to get support as well and we became a kind of a charity of experts by lived experience and yeah. <laughs> bear in mind this was when I was poorly as well so like mum and dad not only trying to support our family drive up and down the motorway to see me wherever I was in, in the UK in a unit because there was nothing in Hull mm -hmm. and then running a charity themselves I mean I they just blow me away and and yeah it's kind of a full circle journey of hope really that I'm now recovered and I'm now I'm now the CEO of that charity. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like a little bit kind of a bit of a prerequisite was obviously pub puberty. We all know we go through that difficult period of puberty of suddenly other people's opinions suddenly seems to be massively important. We're very self-conscious and um, I, I think that's, that's pretty normal. Obviously, there's going to be the extremes of it and, and everybody comes to a uh, from a different degree. Um, for yourself, you said it was strange. It, all, of, all the things you kind of mentioned there go against all of the expectations that people have of what causes eating disorders typically, isn't it? You sort of said there, it was never bullied about my weight or weight wasn't an issue. It wasn't a case of there was any negativity in my household or, you know, it was a, a loving, positive environment. There was no abuse. There was no kind of, other than the bullying being something obviously, you know, that, that you was out of your control. Um, have you come across, a, and, and did you remember coming across uh, a lot of people kind of really trying to dive into that. Well, still kind of saying, well, there must have been something. Or are people more accepting now of a case of it is just a symptom of other mental health challenges maybe you were going through at that time? I think, I think that is such a good question and a good observation because at the moment, the way the world is, is that a lot of people have the, the, the wrong assumption, in my opinion, that eating disorders are caused by media images, social media, um, pressures on dieting, um, narratives around commercials, X, Y, and Z. And, and don't get me wrong, all of these things have a factor when it comes to somebody developing an eating disorder. However, when I was nine, 10 years old, there was no social media. I wasn't reading magazines like where people were being body shamed. I was reading Beano and Dandy and I certainly didn't want to look like Beano and Dandy, you know. <laughs> and and I just think it's very important that we make sure that we don't take an easy route out by blaming society. Like, I often say that words and circumstances that hurt us can push us to stay silent, but pain is always expressed. And when it comes to eating disorders, again, I personally feel like food isn't the cause it's the symptom and for me and, and I think there's a lot to be said about the research around eating disorders as well Andrew like for me it genuinely did come out of nowhere and I think there's a lot to be said about looking at, at genetics about you know the, the makeup of somebody who develops an eating disorder but I think I was looking at some statistics um last year and it was saying that out of let's say a hundred million pounds of research into mental health illnesses only one percent of that was going into eating disorder research and that blows my mind because eating disorders have got the highest mortality rate of any other mental health illness 
one in five will die as a direct result or by taking their own life. And yet there is so little known truly by the um the medical uh, profession and the and the, the medical bodies and going into the government and the NHS, like there is not enough knowledge and knowledge and awareness is so key, as is early intervention when it comes to somebody developing an eating disorder. So yes, there are a lot of misconceptions, but I like to think or I hope that big Bob over here <laughs> when I when I talk about it, people expand their view on on things and it actually resonates a lot more because one of the other things about eating disorder is eating disorders are sorry that they're very complex but they can present themselves with a lot of other comorbidities so like somebody with an eating disorder can also have autism or ADHD or um OCD or they could also have GAD um, general anxiety disorder they might be somebody like for myself, I was addicted to sleeping tablets, but I had anorexia and then I was addicted to exercising and then I, and then I developed an um, obsessive compulsive disorder. <laughs> so, so my point being is that it, it can't just be pigeonholed and, and mm. no pun intended, but no one size fits all. Yeah. Does that make sense? 100%. Um... I know that, as a, and I described it there as a kind of a symptom of other conditions. And I know it is a, a you know, class as a condition unto itself. But it, as yeah. you said, it so often comes with other factors. Oh, fuck um, yeah. And I, I mean, one of the one of the reasons, and again, it's like no, you know, one size doesn't fit all one hundred percent. And 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 I'll um, refer to something later uh, associated with that. But it's I have heard it being referred to, or as I understand it, one big part of it is, is it's a way of controlling something when everything else else in your life may feel out of control. Yeah. Um, and that's going to come from not being in a good place for whatever reason, not being in a good place, not feeling you fit in with others based on neurodiversity or whether it be anxiety based and therefore the world is unpredictable. So at least I can control this. Yeah. Is that how you've ever felt about it? Or would you say it's different for you or other people that you've met? No, that, that's the nail on the head, really. I mean, it, it took me a long time to figure it out and many years of therapy. I didn't I didn't understand this at the time, mm. but I remember coming to sort of the, not the conclusion, but the, the understanding one day that actually it was that I couldn't control what people were saying or doing to me, but I could control some element of what went inside me. Yeah. And, and at that point as well, the smaller I was, the less there was for people to hate and to hurt and I could disappear. Mm. And an eating disorder is very clever as well because it will trick you into thinking that it is your friend and it's not. It's it's categorically not. It's it's mm. your enemy and, and it it wants to destroy you and anyone around you that loves you. It wants to destroy any ounce of goodness in your life. And to that point, I remember feeling like, when when I was when I was getting polio, that would take me out of situations that I couldn't face or control. So it, it it was a very confusing time, and this is why recovery is so hard for so many people because it's your comfort mm. in one way. Like it, it takes you away from reality. It, it takes you away from having to to feel and deal. Yet you are in so much pain. You are in so much distress and sadness and you are wrapped in this my dad often says it's like have, having like your daughter being a prisoner mm. in her own mind so it's such a conflicting and confusing disorder but as many of us know that's that's what's hard about mental health you know it is it, it's the mind it's the power of the brain and it's probably well it is it's our most powerful organ it's like it's the one thing that determines everything so I don't understand why there isn't as much support understanding and systems in place to support mental health as there is with your physical health I I, I just it, it it just blows it just blows my mind I don't I don't understand it I, I'll never forget my dad he was diagnosed with stage three aggressive prostate cancer about 12 years ago now can you imagine if he'd, if he'd have gone there and they'd have gone, oh, 
well, do you know what, Dennis? Can we just wait until you get to stage four and then we'll start to do something about it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you wouldn't? No. No. Anyway, that's that's my little rant. <laughs> <laughs> don't but don't it, worry. It you. Yes, it very much is. For many yes. people, not all, for no. many people, steeped in control. Um, mm. Not so much so, so for somebody with ARFID. And I think that's important to say. So that's avoidant restricted food intake disorder. Right. That's more about they're not focused on on their weight or their body image or size. It's that's more of a fear of certain food types, and it can often mm. be linked to autism. And yeah. like you say, like you mentioned, the processing issues and, and stuff. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because there is about, um, I know there's a number of different kind of uh, what are classed as eating disorders. Um, so you've obviously got anorexia nervosa and uh, bulimia. They're the two ones that most people have heard of, but I think there's yeah. three or four others, isn't there? And one of them you just yeah, mentioned. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's binge eating disorder. Um, so. There's uh, OFSPED, which is other specified feeding and eating disorders. And then there's ARFID. And then often a lot of those disorders cross over. Mm. So you can have um anorexia binge eating type you can yeah. have you know people stereotypically think somebody with anorexia is is low weight that's not the case mm. you know um there's atypical anorexia which is presented anorexia in somebody who is deemed as an, a normal weight or a bigger size body like it's it genuinely is not one size fits all and that that assumption around weight is 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 so damaging and wrong and yeah yeah that's one of the things that when you when you said that one size doesn't fit all, um, it did remind me of a, a friend of mine who we all knew she had um, an unhealthy relationship with food is the way yeah. I'd kind of put it. Um, and we were fairly sure she was anorexic, but went to for medical treatment, went for medical support because we encouraged her to, to be told that she was too fat to be anorexic. You know, oh. So it's, you, ob- you know, I, I don't eat anything. She was being honest about how much she ate. And so will you obviously do though? And- <laughs> it, you know what? It, it's that, words like that, yeah. that can, that can, that can kill somebody. Yeah. You know, and, and like you say, and I've said, often they come from the professionals. Yeah. We, the people who you think shouldn't have ignorance um, yeah. but sometimes have the worst level of ignorance. Yeah. I think there was something you mentioned is kind of being your best friend, but it's your worst friend. Um, I think I, you didn't put it that way. You put it much more eloquently than I just did there. But it kind of, it masks itself. It's false. It's, um, you think it's a safety net. And and I think that's when people don't understand as well, doesn't it? Why why don't they just stop? Why don't they just change? But one, it's it's... I teach a lot around self-harm and things like that. And it is a, a form of self-harm to a degree. Um, it has a lot of similarities, but it's also like a form of substance misuse and the fact that it becomes addictive over a period of time, not in the same way as a kind of a substance does, but in a case of it's a coping strategy. I don't know how to be without this part of my identity or without this way of controlling my life and things like that. And I think there's so often an assumption that, you know, say so people who say, but I want to stop, but then they don't stop. But many smokers have said, I want to stop, but they still pick up the cigarette. But, and, and people can relate to that, but with something like where you can more, maybe more obviously see that it's detrimental, like, you know, not eating to the point that you have to be force fed or you're going to die. People, you know, smoking's never going to be comparable to that. So, so people find it really difficult to understand. Um, but that's essentially what's going on, isn't it? As far as that point. Just- yeah. And, and, and yeah, you, you, you bang on there because I, it is, what do you need to, what do you need to live? Mm. You need water food and sleep yeah. essentially like it like an, an, an air obviously but those those are the there's the four fundamentals out there to be able to function and live so why would anybody choose to to not do one of those things but then it's not a choice it, and an eating disorder is not a choice like I, I i promise you now nobody wakes up one morning and goes oh, you know what today i'm just i'm just gonna try and and be anorexic or like you know and, and it really it really frustrates me but i understand why people see it like that but it is so far from the truth it is not your fault and that's one thing that god bless my dad's light over the years you know some of the things that i've put my parents through and my family through and 
some, some of the actions I've taken, to your point, to fuel the addiction, you know, um, I'm not, I'm not ashamed. I was at the time and I, and I am, it's hard to say out loud, but I'm not ashamed to admit that I, I, I did shoplift when I was, when I was poorly, when I wanted sleeping tablets and I couldn't get any more off the, the doctor, the first thing I did was go and take them. Um, and I got arrested. You know, I remember getting arrested and I can't believe I'm saying this, I've never said it before, but I don't mind. Like I got arrested, unfortunately, the police officer um, and, and the woman who, who, who did arrest me could see I was so poorly and, and believed me when I said, this is what's happening, that they de-arrested me and gave me kindness and compassion. But there are a lot of, a lot of links you know, between that kind of that kind of desperation to to fuel something, and and I look back now and I, and I think how how did I ever believe that? How do I phrase it? Like, say, if you went out with somebody, like one of your mates, and they they encouraged you to to shoplift. And then you got arrested and then they just like laughed at you and just, and just like went, oh, well, <laughs> you take the blame. You wouldn't want to be friends with them anymore, would you? Whereas this is the point about an eating disorder. It's still there. It, it's still, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I never, ever did that. I, I never, I never shoplifted after that moment. And, and I'm so grateful that, that they did arrest me because it, it was a wake up call. Um, but but that that is the length that many people will will go to in their desperation to to continue to please shall we say to feed in a in a sadistic way that eating disorder have you ever encountered an adult or child's behavior that has felt difficult overwhelming or challenging have you sometimes felt at a loss of what to do or know that you didn't handle it quite right People are complex and unpredictable, and their behavior can be like the weather. We've all made the mistake of looking out the window and feeling safe to wear shorts, but five minutes later, wishing for an umbrella. But what if, like a weatherman, you understood how humidity, temperature, and pressure all come together to cause the weather, allowing you to better prepare, predict, and respond, and prevent ever having a picnic ruined by a thunderstorm ever again? My book called Targeting the Positive with Behaviours at Challenge helps you to become the weatherman of behaviour. It provides you with a toolkit to increase competency, confidence, resilience and empathy so you feel more assured about how to respond to distressed or dysregulated behaviours in others, including those affected by trauma, mental health, neurodiversity, learning disabilities or dementia build better connections, achieve de-escalation, and improve outcomes for yourself and those you engage with, with my celebrated six-stage target model, a step-by-step -step process to reduce distress for everyone. Discover my empowering, person-centered guide in Targeting the Positive, written by me, Andy Baker, available from online bookstores worldwide. Find a link in the description and order today. There's, there's something that's kind of underpinned a few of the things that you said actually there, Gemma, and I think it's um, really worth referring back to. And it was, there was a moment where I could see you paused because you were, you were kind of going, you know, I'm not ashamed to say, but there was an element of that I could see you were still wrestling with that, even now yeah. that you were looking back, that you must have experienced a lot of, um, it sounds like both your parents and yourself experienced an awful lot of shame. And maybe that's, you know, whether it, a lot of it probably was self-shaming, but it also could have been other people shaming. And I think it's, it's so important to the fact that you're able to look back on it now and go, I'm not ashamed. Actually, I think it's really, really important because you still recognize it was wrong. You still, yeah. but you no longer believe that you are your behavior. You're, you're able to separate the two, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's where you struggle when you're actually within the illness, when you're actually there struggling every day. And I'm sure your, your parents went through the same that every moment you experience of shame going, I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be doing this to my parents. I shouldn't have just done that. Actually then feed into a pain I can control is better than a pain that I can't. I can't control the shame, but I can control the food intake again, or I can control the exercise, or I can control yeah. the sleeping or whatever it is you're choosing. Um, so I think that's so, so important for people to be aware of and, and pick up from the words that you just said. 
Um, the other thing I'd say is, how did you overcome it? What, what led you to be able to overcome and get to this point where you can look back on it without shame? Um, there, was a, there was a few a few sort of moments over the space of a year or so that really became like a bit of a, a, a big bang. Like, you know, when all the, all, the, all the matters and molecules like come together and all of a sudden there's yeah. this big explosion. Yeah. And, and, and I think that the, the, the two main ones were, well, three. I had a, a heart attack um, when I was, oh God, I think I was 19 or 20. So that that was that was number one, and I remember Mum spotted the warning signs because this is the other thing. I, there's not a lot of awareness around medical risk when it comes to eating disorders. So no. a lot of parents or loved ones get told to mind their child or their their loved one at home and just wait for the referral, wait for the appointment. Nobody says, oh, by the way, if your loved one is bulimic, make sure you get their electrolytes tested and the potassium levels tested and make sure you do this and make sure you do that because it can lead to heart failure heart attacks x y and z so but my mum because of the work she'd done in in understanding eating disorders especially when it came to setting up the charity she she knew straight away when I said I I, I can't feel my arms she was like get in the car but that moment it, it was like an out-of-body experience there's my my mother my my own mum driving her daughter to the hospital and she thinks she's going to lose her. Like that, that was one of the first things that I where I just was like, this isn't a game anymore. Not that it was a game, but it was like, how am I having a heart attack at 19, 20? So there was that. And then I went back into an eating disorder unit um, after that. And I had put enough weight on to be allowed to go out, go home at weekends. And I'd started to try and build up. I'd always been lucky that the lads from primary school were still my best mates to, to that day, 19, 20. And they were really like brilliant in terms of trying to get me to go out because I, I, shame, I was so ashamed. I didn't want to see anybody in Hull. I felt silly. I felt humiliated. But also I was tiny. And people would stare at me because, like, if I didn't have my collarbone covered up, like, it, it just, yeah, I, I didn't look, I didn't have the confidence to be going out with a group of girls who were in their absolute blooming period. <laughs> um, but the lads helped me and mum used to make me clothes that, that, that fitted better. She was so amazing. Um, and so I used to go out with the lads every weekend and I remember... Um, one weekend I had gone home. I normally used to get the train from Sheffield, which is where the unit was. Um, but another girl who was in the unit with me, she was from Hull and she was doing really well. And she just started a relationship, which was like massive for her and, and is for anybody who was going through an eating disorder. Um, and she was like, oh, he's coming to pick me up. Do you want to lift home? And so I got a lift home in the car that day and I remember my phone ringing and it was my mum and she went, are you darling, what time does your train get in? I said, oh no, I'm, I'm not today, I'm, I'm getting a lift. She went, oh, uh, okay, so have you got any idea? And I was like, how long's a piece of string? Like, I, I, I don't drive, I don't know. And then one of my best mates, Danny, texted me and was like, you know, what time are you getting back? Um, and I was like, we're not going out tonight, are we? I thought we was going out tomorrow. And he was like, oh, no, no, I just wanted to know what time you were getting back. And then another of them, Brindle, texted me and was like, what time are you? And this went on. I was thinking, God, if there's not like a massive bouquet of flowers at the end of this trip and, and, and like, you know, like a big serenade, um, I'm going to be livid. Um, and I got back home to Hull and I walked through the door and there was my mum and Danny I sat there. And my mum just said, Gemma, I'm so sorry, love, but Lee's died. And I remember sort of like thinking, Lee, who's Lee? I was like, the only Lee I know is, is the Lee who gave me my first kiss when we were seven years old at primary school and with my first ever boyfriend. The only Lee I know is like my best mate who 
has been there through thick and thin for me. The only thing I know is the Lee Young last weekend took me to one side and begged me to get out of hospital and to start living my dreams because he wanted to be front stage, you know, when I was on living my dreams, doing my acting, because he knew that's what I wanted to do. And I was like, that's the only Lee I know. And she just scoops me up and she hits that Lee. And so I, I, I just remember sort of going, well, well, well what, what, how did it happen? Like, what was the accident? Like, what went on? And she said, no, darling, she said he, he, he took his own life. And I remember, I remember going to the funeral and they allowed me out of the unit to go. And again, mum was there with me and my dad. And I remember looking across to Lee's mum and dad and his newborn baby sister and his teenage sister and looking at all of the lads, 20-year-old, massive rugby players all in a heap crying and just thinking, I'm doing exactly the same thing, but much slower and right in front of my parents and my best friend's eyes. And I was like, if I can't do it for me, I've got to do it for Lee and my mum and dad. And so that was another sort of turning point and then the final bit came when I'd gone back to to Sheffield to this unit and I was begging my dad to to, to keep me home because it was an, it was just an awful place like we've touched on it but like the care system and the the units and the way the staff treated you like you were just a commodity a waste of space like a, a naughty little girl like it was just awful and I remember being going back and, and we got shipped into a, a a family meeting, an emergency family meeting by the head nurse. And they were happy with the fact that my mum and dad had set up an eating disorder charity, like, which is just crazy. Like, what's that got to do with them? But they were happy with me because I wasn't apparently conforming to X, Y and Z. Anyway, I'm in this meeting and I'm like, I'm, I'm miles away. It's only been like a week or so since Lee had passed. And I'm like, I'm just not interested anymore. I've got no respect for these people. And I, I just, I'm already planning what I'm going to do that night um, to join Lee, basically. And I heard a zip pull outside the door. And I don't know what it was, but I was like, that's my case. And I just jumped up, went outside. And there they were with my suitcase from the weekend, all with the other inpatients watching and they were going through all my stuff to look for things that I shouldn't have brought back. And I just lost it. I just, I, I've never, I've never been more angry, upset, and out of control in all of my life. And I begged and pleaded with my mum and dad to take me home that very, that very day, that, that moment. And mum didn't want to take me home because she was worried that I might die. And she couldn't cope with me. And that's no reflection on her, but I say, like, it, it, she was just lost. And my dad looked me in my eyes and he said, if I do this, things have got to change. And, and I held him and I said, Dad, I'm begging you. And he took me home and my mum didn't speak to him for weeks. And the, it was it was just horrendous. But I looked at my dad again and I was just like, he has taken the biggest sacrifice. He's sacrificing his marriage is sacrifice like my siblings didn't want me home not that they didn't love me but they didn't want me there like why would you I was destroying everything and it was just those three moments that came together where I I, I made a vow to, to, to try and make a change and I went into therapy intense therapy in hold three times a week there were boundaries set up by mum and dad about what was acceptable and what was not um the eating disorder was not allowed to get away with things in the family home and it was tough and it was hard but I finally found a therapist who spoke to me about me as a human being and the more I did it for the love of my parents and my family the more I started to realize that I can actually live because I'm a decent person and I can love myself too and it took a good four years that recovery process um but then within a year, I got to drama school and a year after I was in Emmerdale. <laughs> right, you, you, got, you got my eyes watering about three times in that story there. So 
I don't. <laughs> I get, I get, to be honest, I don't know. I get through it sometimes. I kind of like go on autopilot, but like it's very real in me and it's very there. And I think, yeah, I think a lot of people often like say to me, and I take it as a compliment that despite what I've achieved since, I'm very grounded and down to earth. And I think it's because of all these things that, that have happened. You know, there's I know. A, a fight that you've taken yourself, isn't there? But also maybe you, there's a huge sense of, of gratitude. There was a kind of a, uh, obviously there was two huge amounts of pain in that story there. One being a heart attack and at your age and the, and obviously, you know, y- your mum um, kind of going through it or you're being able to recognise your mum going through that. The second one, obviously the loss of one of your closest friends and and that difficulty of missing out on on those things. But then that third thing of just, you know, your dad's taking a chance on you. Your dad kind of just going, I'm never giving up on you. Um, oh. Yeah, just just immense. You nearly got me going earlier, actually, with the mum, your mum making clothes for you as well. That oh, nearly she... got me as well. So, I mean, amazing parents that you've had oh. throughout that journey. I, I, honestly, I am, I am one of the luckiest, like, genuinely. I've nearly died five times and I, and I, and I don't take that for granted. Um, but my mum and dad are just, I mean, I, I'm just, yeah, I'm, I don't even know how to articulate it. I, I just, I love them more than life itself. Like, and my, my friends, everyone knows Marge and Den, like they, I, I just turned 40 this year and we, we went away for a few days and I invited all my friends to this, um, this like country pub in Brig, which was all hours for the weekend. And the lengths that mum and dad went to, to to make it special, like with the games and the mum doing homemade scotch eggs and like just looking after everyone. And I was just like, wow, for all those years of pain, this is what this is. This is why it was so worth it. It most reflects on obviously some of the people that were, um, that we were appealing to or talking to on this. You know, there is some amazing parents who do listen to the podcast, but there's also foster parents and things like that so for for kids who are going through the same system and you've obviously experienced the, the negativity of the system we've had a few people not you're not the first one who's got on the soapbox a little bit and kind of gone yeah. a little bit of a rant to going <laughs> it's not good it. enough it's not fit for purpose yeah. and and um uh, a close friend of mine she has a, a daughter who's still struggling with her um with her eating disorders and and things and some of the communication that she's received about being a naughty girl and things like that is just yeah, just yeah. unbelievable across but it um you know there is people or individuals out there who don't have that support network like no. you, as you said you're, and you're so grateful for that and that's amazing but the hope is from from things like this what i do is that i'm appealing that the things that they did there is other people in those young people's lives that could do the same as what your parents did and not give yeah. up on them and and focus on the kind of the um the positives and stuff was there other things? I mean, for me, there's, there's there's a strange thing, and I've come across it from a few people, like making you clothes to help you to feel comfortable may seem like a little bit, but isn't that the condoning the behaviour and saying that it's okay? But there's a, but I, it's that where, you know, covering the scars and those sorts of things, like isn't that condoning it? But it's 100% the right thing to do, to go, no, but we need to make a... Ha- reducing your happiness wouldn't have decreased the likelihood of you engaging in yeah. in those kind of behaviors and stuff so. but by doing that she helped me grow out with my friends if if in in some ways she was actually challenging me because she wasn't giving me she wasn't allowing the eating disorder to have an excuse to not go out with my friends anymore because she'd made me something that i felt more comfortable in whereas eating disorder would have come up with every excuse not to go and see my friends so actually um that's what she did but then the other thing she used to do was she would knit and make fleeces and hoodies and hats for for all the people in these different units that I went into because they were freezing you know that their body temperature was so low and because they were so unwell um so we all used to (laughs) walk around it matching like fleeces (laughs) and I'm like Oh my god! But you've you've got like you have got to take you've got to laugh at some of this stuff. Like, yeah, I I could never have laughed about it before. And there's some there is some moments that I've been through that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. But even mm. in those moments, I I had to laugh to survive it. So obviously, laughing helps. Um, yeah. 
having knitted hoodies and, and fleeces and stuff like that and, and being encouraged to, to be brave and to give you that, that, that things to self care. But what else for anybody out there who's kind of going through this and maybe from family members, you know, what else can they do to help somebody? Yeah, it was really interesting. The I've been going and I, I live in London, but I've been going home to whole lot to do my BBC radio show. Um, and mum, just one day, she was like, Should we go out and have a, a coffee? And I was like, Oh, yeah, that'd be really nice. So, me, mum, and dad, like, we, we went out. I mean, she says coffee, coffee for dad, uh, an Aperol spritz for me and mum. <laughs> and we went, we went to our little, a local pub. Um, and sat outside in the sun and, and we just nattered about anything and everything. And what people who follow me on, on social media, they're, they're very probably aware that we're going through a lot at Seed at the moment and I'm fighting tooth and nail to, to keep us going. But we've gone through a lot of stress this last year with Seed. Anybody who runs a small charity will understand where I'm coming from or equally who runs a small business. Um, and Seed has been all consuming to the point where it's been quite a negative on us all as a family because it's taken us back to where the eating disorder was all consuming, if that makes sense. And so I knew what mum was doing. She wanted us to go out for a, a coffee and a natta to talk about anything but seed. And I said to her, I said, I know what you're doing. She went, what do you mean? And they went, what we used to do. And what we used to do was we would, they would take me out for a coffee and we would, we would all whether we were arguing with each other moments before about about tea time, about whatever, when it came to those, that hour or two where we'd go out and have a coffee together, we would talk about anything but that. And I know it sounds so simple, but it's making sure that you don't lose your loved one in the midst of all of this. They are still Tom or Beth or Jamie. They are still that person. They are still your husband, your your wife, your son, your nephew, your best mate, because that is what can happen and that is where it gets even more muddied, where you lose your friend or your loved one in the eating disorder and it's too hard to get them back out. So that's one of my my biggest things. Obviously, it goes without saying about going to a GP if you feel like something's going wrong or there are warning signs or you're struggling equally I know it's a postcode lottery you know my GP the first time round wasn't the best but having said that the second time round my GP definitely kept me alive like Dr Barnes was amazing in my later stages so if you go to a GP and they're not giving you the answers that you need you go to another one like you, you say to your surgery I need to speak to somebody else or I need to speak or you go to a different surgery um there are so many brilliant eating disorder charities around the UK. Um, Seed are part of an alliance called Red Can, which is the Regional Eating Disorder Charity and Alliance Network. And they're all around the country. So whatever area you're in, if you can't get anywhere with your mental health services or CAMS at that point, they should be able to signpost. But when it comes to the practicalities, I would definitely say it's about normalising the conversation. Um, eating disorders love confrontation uh, they thrive off it so it's I always say it's best to if you are concerned about somebody it's a conversation rather than you're not eating I've seen you go to the after meals you're doing this you're losing weight you're doing that it's look I feel like something's changed the sparks going like you seem sad like you're not coming to this with us anymore like what's going on and and how can I help mm. it, that is the conversation and equally you don't have to take it on all on your own there are charities out there like Seed who are there to support the loved ones and family members as well so those are a few sort of like you know tips off the top of my head but our website seed.charity www.seed.charity that has so much wealth of knowledge and self-help and there's a lot of videos on there from myself um about different stages of eating disorders and how to deal with weight gain or how to talk to somebody who you love who you might think is is struggling so yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff out there yeah you're not on your own 
So I think um, there is a, there must feel, and I'm sure your parents went through it and I'm sure you went through it as well, of kind of a, a sense of hopelessness mm. um, as far as something like this, especially getting to the stages and the severity that it sounds like, like you got to at times within your illness. Yeah. Um, but that's it. It is that isolation, isn't it? Of like feeling, well, nobody else understands this. And, and especially yeah. if you do have certain professionals thrown around shaming and blaming and pointing the finger, as you mentioned, towards the early early past of the kind of the chat we're having towards your parents of what have, what have you done to cause this in your daughter? Um, but that's it. There is so many amazing resources out there if you have the right places to look. I think as you, you mentioned there, there's two parts, isn't it? We've mentioned the shame and, and not shaming, not blaming, not criticizing, kind of recognizing that if it was a choice, then it wouldn't be a choice anybody would make. Yeah, yeah. But also that it sounds like the acceptance that even when you were going out for just your your chat with your mum or just sitting and having a coffee where you would talk about anything but, it was that chance for you to be you, uh, mm -hmm. not your illness, not to be defined by it. Again, yeah. it's separating that you are not your behaviour. Um, yeah. You know, it is... And don't get me wrong, you've got to take accountability. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's a fine line there, but it absolutely is about making sure that you're not lost in all of that. Yeah. Um, one of the big things for me was theatre. You know, I went to the theatre so much with my mum and dad. And even mm. to this day, like if I'm getting stressed out or struggling, not with my eating disorder, because I mean, I'm recovered, but there's a recovery after recovery process. So yeah. I, there's, I keep a check of it. I always say like, it's in the back pocket and every now and again, it tries to like rear its ugly head and I tell it very politely to do one, <laughs> mm. for want of a better word. Yeah. Um, but if I need to just mentally de-stress or just get away I, that that's what I'll do I'll take myself off to see some some plays or some musical theatre and, and I think that's a really important tip as well that it's not just about everything around you it's about you yourself and and mm. doing what's right for you um yeah. and that self-care and self-love um yeah. I know it might sound a bit like mm, yawn but it, it's it's so important. Mm -hmm. Like I went for a massage yesterday and I really loved it. And I was like, I, I don't feel guilty about it. I, I could have done some work. I've got loads to do, but actually I need to clear my head and I need some time out. And and mm -hmm. that's what I did. And that's, that's so important as well. I think. It's, it's one of the things that I teach about when I'm teaching around um, self-harm or, or anything like that, the, the, when we're always targeting the positive, which is, which is always my approach to kind of, uh, behavior management there will have been things that you're already doing to help you to feel better that weren't the eating disorder but often they're not noticed or acknowledged or recognized because yeah. people are too busy focusing on the eating disorder or the self-harm so there would have been things like watching a play you probably yeah. maybe did manage a better meal the next day because you'd watched a play the day before or something like that because yeah. you just felt happier in yourself but nobody did make a mental note of that and I think that's one of the things I always try and teach professionals or parents or anything that they already have strategies. They're just not recognizing how useful they are to them. Yeah. So they're the things you need to reinforce. They're the things you need to encourage that, you know, finding those opportunities for joy and success and mastery and control of things that are positive rather than control of things that are negative, like being able to, you know, control and follow a script and do a play. Do you think, yeah. do you think that is maybe um, an element of the acting and stuff like that you've done has almost become that, that, replacement in some ways it's you know we all have our drugs of some description yeah. and it's I know that I'm a I'm a workaholic and and uh, an, uh, an academic and I love studying and I love working and that's definitely replaced things that were less positive in my life throughout yeah. do you think that's something for you oh uh, yeah definitely I don't mean definitely. to psychoanalyze you by the way Gemma sorry no 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 <laughs> like, I love it like bring it on like I, I still have therapy I'm all I'm, I'm, I read I read books about like psychotherapy and yeah but also like about your mindset and the power of the universe I'm very I'm very open to to those kinds of discussions but you're absolutely right like when I did my TEDx it was like this is my, this is what my brain's like. I'm here for a bigger purpose, and I shouldn't be here at all. I should disappear. So of course, I became an actress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like, it, like it's the most weird thing to choose to be, but on stage and and delivering and and being somebody else has always helped me either disappear in it all 
or as my drama teacher used to say use the dirt like I can channel all of that past and all of those feelings into into my performance and it's very cathartic and for whatever reason I wanted I think there's something in me still to this day where I, I want to be acknowledged and recognized and, and loved and I'm it might sound like bizarre to say it but it's definitely something that's in my psyche you know to people please to to bring people joy to be brilliant in a play to to deliver a great TEDx like everything I do I need it to be the best um and that's something that I'm working on even to this day that actually it's okay to just take it steady and be loved for who you are and you don't need validation of other people I think that's why I've been single for like four or five years now because I'm I'm so in a place of like I just want to figure me out and I'm not worried about that. And people are like, oh, you're fair, 40 and you haven't got kids and you haven't got a boyfriend, you haven't been married. And I'm like, no, because newsflash, I lost 14 years of my life and I'm, like, I'm making it up now. I'm learning who I am. And when the time comes, who knows? I might get whisked off my feet and I might fall in love. But equally, I might end up just being in love with my family and friends and my dog. And that is absolutely fine with me because it's what makes me happy. And being on stage and performing, presenting, radio presenting, whether it's my public speaking, whether it's my acting, that that's me giving, being me and wanting to wanting to live, wanting to thrive, I guess. Because it's um you kind of said it there a little bit, you lost however long that the, the, the eating disorder, your mental illness and was all a huge part of your identity to some degree, wasn't it? You must've got lost in that sense of this is who I am. This is what I am. This is, um, and must be so easy to kind of drown in that, in that kind of, um, identity. And as you said, now you stepped away from that, you're essentially exploring this, well, who am I now? Uh, what's my identity yeah. now? And it's, um, so how long did you say it's been since you kind of feel like maybe you you overcame um, your illness? I would say about 16 years. Yeah. 16 yeah. years. In terms of not actively being in it, but I definitely feel like I'm still unpicking a lot of that stuff. Mm. And that's okay. Yeah. Like, that's what therapy's for. <laughs> it is. And... and- Again, one of the things that I try and get over is, you know, I, I, always, I use smoking as an example because quite a lot of people have some, uh, some awareness of that. So, I, you know, I, I was a smoker from 16 to 25. I quit however many years. And then I went through a major relationship breakdown and that's it. The first thing I did was pick up a cigarette because sometimes when we're lost, we go back to old mm-hmm. paths. And in, in like many alcoholics kind of say, I'll always be an alcoholic because... Yeah. You know, I can never drink again because I know how easy it is for me to then find that old path. If I feel like I need a drink, then I've already te- stepped on that first bad path again because I'm feeling lost yeah. somewhere else. And then that's, again, any ingrained habit that you've been doing for years, especially that adolescent period where it's kind of when you're laying down the the neuron pathways in your brain as far as, you know, this, this is what I need for adulthood. They're always going to be there a little bit. And, and you said you've got an amazing ability now to be able to go, yeah, but you can, you can sod off. I'm not doing that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, yeah. I've, you've got your better strategies and stuff, but. Yeah. Um, and, and no, to your point about smoking, it was, I am now two years and three weeks since my last cigarette. And, you know, like you, I smoked from being 14, mm-hmm. gosh, to being 38. So it's like, like 24 years of my life. Mm. But even even now, I walk past somebody and they're, they're smoking, and I go, "Oh, oh just rip, rip it out <laughs> of the hand, yeah." <laughs> but, I, but then I go, "But no, I've come this far. I'm, I'm not mm-hmm. going back." Like, yeah. so I'm I'm quite. People look at me and think like because I've I studied my growth a lot as well, so I'm still quite I'm quite dinky, um, yeah. up five four and a peanut. And people look at me and and I think they underestimate how strong I actually am. Um, and that's kind of like my superpower from all of this, I think. 
yeah my resilience and my strength to to keep surviving yeah and not just surviving but determined to make the best out of things like I'm at a very different period in my life now where I don't want the drama I'm an actress but I don't want the drama <laughs> I don't do want for a living now you do it on stage don't yeah. want it at home yeah 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 and it was funny because I was speaking to one of my best friends last night um Ash and he said something really really lovely and I feel the same about him he was like do you know what he said I've had three conversations today Jen and the others have just dr- like they've drowned me they've, they've like drank from my cup and I and I just like I've come off the phone and I've nothing left yeah and he just said you fill my cup and I was like and you fill mine and that's that that's what I want in my life I want I want people around me who are gonna who are gonna fill it and when it's when it's empty be there to replenish it radiators and drains I mean. yeah radiators are people who give energy and give well-being into your life whereas drains are what take it away so yeah you want to fill your life with radiators be aware of the drains some of them may be important to you but then you minimize and you only give them a certain amount of your time so yeah make sure you uh nurture and utilize your radiators and then you can uh, you can spare a little bit of time for the drains sometimes because they don't they sometimes (laughs) need you they sometimes need you but you you have those boundaries 100 yeah yeah yeah. Well, thank you so much, Gemma. I could, I could honestly spend more time talking to you, but I'm aware oh, you're, a, you're a very busy lady and you've got other things that you've got to move on to. So, um, but obviously we will put a link to Seed and I'll try and get the details of it. Was it, did you say Red Car or something? I, I Red missed. Can, yeah. Red Can, Red Can, yeah. Red Can, yeah. I'll and I'll, I'll give you the details of that as well. Perfect. So we'll make sure there's a link to that as well. So people yeah. who are who are reaching out or needing some support. And I'll put a link to your TED talk as well, because it sounds like that'd be really worthwhile kind of people watching and, yeah. and engaging with. But um, yeah, I, honestly, it could be something I'd, I'd love to maybe chat with you again one time and stuff. Um, you know, it genuinely was a, a pleasure to find out. And the journey you've been on is phenomenal. Um, and, and I'm sure many times people seeing you on stage or people seeing you on TV programs, if they didn't, weren't aware of the background, they would have absolutely no idea. And I think that's something that kind of, hey, look what, you're not defined by, by either your past or your difficulties or your challenges yeah. from day to day. So yeah, no, it's wonderful. So thank you so much for your time. No, thank you. Thank you for, for having me. And I'm going to take away the drains and the, the radiators. That's my new, my new tagline now. <laughs> So anybody watching this or listening to this, if you found anything we've talked about useful, interesting or worthwhile, please like, share and comment. Do reach out to charities like Seed as well if you need support. Sounds like there's loads of amazing resources on there. And keep your eye on Gemma and listen to her radio show as well. I'm sure she shares insights and uh, uh, and, and and shares more about her, her history and her past and her future. So um, uh, thank you again, Gemma, for your time today. And uh, yeah, see you next time. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever find the pressures of supporting, teaching or caring for someone else overwhelming and wish you had access to more support and information? The Able to Care podcast in connection with Able Training has created the AbleHub.uk where for less than the price of a coffee a week, you can access exclusive podcast content, resources, events and over 45 certified online courses covering topics like self-care, understanding dementia, neurodiversity, first aid, conflict management, financial advice, and so much more, with new content and courses being added each month. We are so confident that you will benefit from the Able Hub that we are offering 14 days access completely free of charge. No contract, cancel anytime. Become part of the ablehub.uk community and gain the support, knowledge, and resources you deserve. Don't struggle alone. Be able. Find the link in the description.